<laughs> algebra was my undoing because you know once the alphabet got involved in math i'm done i'm sorry why why are there letters in this equation uh no i i started actually started on april 1st 2000, 2000 april 1st 1984 april fool's day 84 it was my wow. first night. and five minutes into my set in my head i heard this voice you're home i'm home Aww. my second thought was i'm gonna do this for a living of course i had no idea how uh i thought about doing a keynote at some point called what could you do if you didn't know no better because i had no idea how hard it was to make a living doing stand-up so I said to my girlfriend, then now my wife of 35 years, <laughs> I'm going on the road to be a professional stand up comedian. Do you want to come along? Thinking she would go, Oh, hell no. <laughs> and she goes, Yeah. So we gave up our apartment and our wow. jobs, piled into the car, and she and I were on the road together without a home, nonstop for 2,000. I love that. And 29 <laughs> nights in a row. Yep. I love that. She's got to be an incredible woman. Yeah, somebody said to me, some comic I worked with years ago, are you still married to Wendy? A dude. <laughs> Who divorces a woman like that? Come on. <laughs> so, exactly. Well, she had said in her younger years or teen years to herself, the one thing she didn't want was an ordinary life. Well, careful what you wish for. Because, you know, it's it's been an, it's been interesting. <laughs> uh, and I think... The, doing what you love for a living and then which was comedy I, I i knew since the fourth grade that's what i was meant to be and then when i found my purpose and my passion which is speaking on suicide prevention you know i locked on to that i think that you know the the miles don't take the toll that they normally do if you're not happy or you don't you haven't found your purpose you know your passion mm. so i've been really lucky um, in that sense, that you know, I think if you do what you yeah. love for a living, you're going to sh- you, the miles won't show quite so much. I love that, and you know, it's time just seems when you love when you're doing what you love and you mm-hmm. can make a career out of it. Time really seems to go a little slower. I find because you're in the now and you're really paying attention and you're enjoying it. Whereas when you're living without purpose and without passion and kind of day to day and everybody every day looks the same and weeks go by months go by nothing stands out i think it's 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 a sad way to live yes and i noticed the other day that i was talking to my college roommate because i'm going to be back in atlanta where he lives in i think it's in september end of september and he's retiring and i realized pretty much everybody i went to college with is retired or retiring. Certainly everybody I went to high school with retired or retiring. And and I, that's not I mean, that that's not really, I mean, you know, I don't I have no plans to retire. I mean, it's you know, it, I mean, let's face it, I work 45 minutes a night. It's not like I'm digging digital. Uh, you know, it's not really physically taxing, although the travel is. I tell the audience on the cruise ships when I do comedy, uh, look, um uh, you, uh, you know, you I, I, you pay me to get here. The jokes are free. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> Have you ever experienced something so crippling in your life that has made you feel broken? I have. Are you someone who has a giving heart but is struggling to feel good themselves? Are you consistently putting your needs aside to take care of everyone else? If so, you're not alone. Giving starts with giving to yourself so that you are able to give of yourself to other people. Isn't it time you took back control and discovered what makes you tick? Join me in my journey and find out how you can feel better about yourself, live your best life, and share that with others. Thinking of yourself, it doesn't make you selfish. It makes you brave. I'm Nelia, and this is the Giving Starts With You podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Giving Starts With You podcast. I'm your host, Nellia Hutt. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing sharing community. And this podcast is all about trying to end loneliness and, and show each other that you don't have to be alone. Life is hard enough going through it by yourself. Um, it's just 
no one should have to do that. You know, we can all be alone together if, if you if you want to say it that way. Um, today, I am so excited and I'm so honored to have Frank King here. How are you, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just surfing the crazy, baby. <laughs> Frank is incredible, and I appreciate you coming on. I know you're a busy guy, and I know you uh, love to speak about this topic today to really start the conversation with people. So today, yes. yeah, absolutely. So Frank King, he is a suicide prevention speaker. He's been a writer for The Tonight Show for 20 years. That's a long time. He's yeah. also been a comedian for 37 years. Yes, a a comedian who speaks about suicide prevention. This is going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. He fought a lifetime battle with depression and chronic suicidality, turning that dark, dark long journey into seven, not one, but seven TEDx talks and insights on mental health awareness. Frank, this topic is so um, needed to be shared. Um, I think... I don't know how you feel, but I think that people are starting to talk about it more often than when I was a teenager, oh, which yeah. I'm grateful for, um, but I still think it's not enough. So welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Who's oh, Frank? My <laughs> Tell my us a little bit a, about you. <laughs> I, have a, I have a soft spot in my heart for British Columbia because as we talked about off the, off the air before the, uh, well, I guess we were recording, so maybe you'll hear the story. Uh, yeah, I'm in Ontario, not too, uh, not too far. Oh wow, wow. absolutely. Um, yeah. The uh, 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 Collingswood is where I did the talk in Collingwood. Uh, yeah, it's only about an hour from here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and so my first my my first was I had to leave the country to do TEDx. Like Frank, I'm sorry, you're you're not qualified here. You have to go to Canada. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I love it. We um before we started recording, I was telling you how my family sat and watched two or three of your TED talks, and wow, they were good. Um, they the topics were like I said are, are very needed in today's world, um, in everyday world, really. They're just as important now as they were 20, 30, 40 years ago, and I think will continue to be. And um, so how does a comedian talk about suicide? You know, that's the first question on every podcast. And actually, when I keynote, I open up my show by going, okay, I know what you're thinking. A comedian talking about suicide? Just exactly how does that work? Uh, well, depression and suicide run in my family. It's called generational depression and suicide. My grandmother died by suicide. My mother found her. My great aunt died by suicide. My mother and I found her. I was four years old. I screamed for days. I will spare you the story. I, I know Nelia knows it because she watched the my first TEDx talk where I, I talk about what happened. Um, and if you are already hardwired for suicide and you're that close to an actual suicide, then statistically you are more likely to seriously consider taking your life and so I did in 2010, seriously consider to the point where I can tell you what the barrel of my gun tastes like. And I believe where there is humor, there is hope, where there's laughter, there's life. That nobody dies laughing. And if you think about it now, the world's first comedians were the court jesters. Mm. And their job was to speak truth to power on behalf of the powerless with humor. And I believe I speak truth to the power of mental illness on behalf of those often powerless in its grip with humor. Hmm. More than one person said to me after they've seen me speak or saw one of my TED Talks, you know, I live with the same conditions. I could just never put it into words. And you, you, you've been able to put what I was thinking into words. And, you know, there's, there's the chronic suicidal ideation. It means that it's, it's relatively rare. It's not even in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, yet. And I, I've, I've talked to clinicians who've been in the business 20 years, and they, they stare at me like fish in a pond when, when I mentioned chronic suicidal ideation. And I talk about it in my keynote, and I tell, I tell people what it means is, for people like me, me and people like me, uh, the idea of suicide, the option of suicide, is always on the menu as a solution for problems large and small. And I say, when, I'm when I talk small, a couple of years ago, my car broke down. I had three, you know, things 
that popped into my mind unbid. One, get it fixed. Two, buy a new one. Three, I could just kill myself. And the power of telling that story out loud is since 2014, pretty much every keynote I've ever done, there's been at least one person in the audience, sometimes more, who have that condition, chronic suicidal ideation, and they had no idea it had a name, that it mm. was a thing. They think they're just some kind of freak and completely alone. I did a college presentation. A young woman came up afterward. She goes, uh, thank you for your keynote. I said, you're welcome. She goes, but I got to tell you, it made me weep. How did it make you weep? She goes, you know your story about the car? Get it fixed, buy a new and kill yourself? I've been having those thoughts all my life. Mm. I didn't know that was a thing, had a name. I, I just thought I was some kind of freak and completely alone. And then I heard you say that out loud. And I realized for the first time in my life that I am not in fact alone and I wept. That's the that's that's the power of of starting the conversation on all things mental health, mental illness, so forth. Is the, the people in the audience who think, because you know how people are with mental illness, you know, you figure it's just you. Yeah, I that's thought, the scariest part sometimes. Yes. I before I knew what before I knew that that what I was what was happening to me was a thing and had a name, I felt like it was just me. You know, I mean, but nobody else thinks like this is nuts. It's you know, it's uh <laughs> Yeah, what's wrong with me? Like why am I not normal? You know, yes. like yeah. And it's a coping mechanism, really. A young woman came up to me in Cincinnati recently after, well, I did a little preview of my breakout and she met me in the, in the, in the foyer, uh, you know, I'm leaving. She comes out on purpose to, to, to meet me. And she goes, I, I've got that. I, 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 what, what, is there a drug for this? I said, no, there's, no, I'm afraid there's no medication for, for chronic suicidal ideation. But I said, I think the, you need to think of it this way. It's just a coping mechanism. It's a way your your brain, your brain, my brain handles stress. You can do this, you can do that, or hell, you can just kill yourself. It's just, um, you know, it's not a serious thought. You don't have to act on it. It's just something that your your brain thinks, is, hey, here's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, that's the power of starting the conversation, I think, and, and making people realize that they're not alone in the things they're thinking, feeling, suffering from. It, it just the feeling that you're not the only one it mm -hmm. makes you feel not so crazy it doesn't make you question yourself as much at least there's somebody who else who feels that way I mean of course we don't want others to feel the same way because it's a horrible way to live and it's a horrible feeling but just to have that connection with somebody it it can really give you hope where there is none on that score, I did a, one of my TEDx talks was mental with benefits, the evolutionary advantages of mental illness, because I kept bumping into people who are mentally ill, uh, generally high functioning, who had some other amazing ability, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a great writer, actor, comedian. And I thought this cannot be a coincidence. And so I did a little research. And if you, if you look at the laundry list of people who are famous, infamous, uh, wealthy, whatever. It, the, it's an amazing list of people who have one mental challenge or another. Mm. And and I did the talk specifically for for young people. And here's here's why. It opens up. This, this is the flip side of um, you know now you know you have something, and so maybe a little less hopeless at that point. But there's, I thought there's got to be a way to frame this so that yes, you have a mental illness, but you know what? I bet you have some mental ableness you're not aware of. It starts like this. What if those of us living with a mental illness are not living with a genetic mutation, but an amazing evolutionary adaptation? Mm -hmm. And what if what we're living with is as Malcolm Gladwell, a Canadian, uh, says in his book, David and Goliath, is a desirable disadvantage. You would never wish it on anyone. However, it comes with certain advantages. And what if you could convince young people that yes, you have a mental illness, but here's what they haven't told you yet. You probably have some mental ableness your peers cannot touch. And if we could if we could convince a young person of that, I believe we could change the frame for them and their peers, reduce stigma, bullying, and eventually use suicide. And I said to the audience, look, here's the deal. I do not believe I am broken. I believe I was made this way. 
I believe my depression and thoughts of suicide are simply the flip side of my comedic ability, creativity, and imagination. It's the same brain. It's the same wiring. I can teach you to write stand-up. I can teach you to perform stand-up. What I cannot teach you to do is process the incoming information the way my brain does. Mm. It's And I believe that's my, those, those are, that's my superpower. And it's, it is, it is all part and parcel. You know, it's the yin and the yang. It's the, and I, I just, I, I truly believe, and you know what, 30 or 35 U.S. companies, Fortune 500 companies, are now hiring people on the spectrum hmm. for their singular ability and paying them handsomely. These are these are people who've been living in their parents' basement because they can't support themselves independently. Now they're making a good salary simply doing the one thing that they are most qualified for. Hmm. So I, I think if we can change the frame in that Mm -hmm. way that yes you have a disability but guess what let's treat the disability and let's embrace energize and wrap our arms around the ability yeah let's celebrate all the other parts of you that are are soaring right you know i read something somewhere once and i forget where it was but it's um they looked at the type of people that tend to uh, gravitate more to depression in these things like their way of thinking and a lot of them are creatives Mm-hmm. A lot of them, like you were talking about actors, singers, you know, songwriters, like, yeah. and I wonder why that is like, I'm a creative person. And I know that I don't know if it's my anxiety or depression or what it is. But I know that I'm hyper everything. So if I feel something, um, maybe the person next to me who isn't that way, does not feel like doesn't even it doesn't even register on their radar. No. But for me, it's like everything is so high, like I'm so uh, more aware, right? Yes, yes. I was having this conversation with a friend of mine who's got lives with borderline, but uh, lives with borderline disorder, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's you know some people call it um, with PTSD, it's called uh, uh, hypervigilance. Mm-hmm. I go, yes, I but it's also I believe again. Let's put a positive frame on. It. Yes. I believe it is, it is not necessarily hypervigilance. It is um, it's situational awareness. Mm, I love that. Well, and you know, because I've said to, I had a conversation the other day about, uh, there's a show called The Mentalist. Mm-hmm. And it's a guy uh, who is hired by the police department because it appears he can read minds, but that's not what he's doing. It's a very simple process. You just have to practice. You know, if somebody's lying or somebody, you know, you can, you, you can, assess the situation very quickly, use all the clues available because that's the way your brain works. And we're talking about somebody, uh, I said, I was walking next to someone, somebody's coming toward us and the person coming toward us smiled. But after we passed them, I said, did you notice that that smile never reached his eyes? Mm. And he goes, well, uh, no. (laughs) That would be the first thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, that's the kind of thing you pick up, you know, these cues, mm. uh, you know, in the, in the, in, I'm walking in the grocery store on one aisle and then the next aisle, there's a couple of they're arguing and I can, I, you know, I can hear the tension in both their voices, you know, and I've, I've said to myself under my breath, that's not going to end well. Um, but yeah, and actually it's, um, I love to guess where people are from mm. and it's an mentalist friend of mine said, Frank, that's a thing. It's called a cold read. You mm-hmm. look them up and down, you listen to them, look at the way they're dressed, look at their facial features, and then you, intuition, just take your best shot. So I'm coming back from Canada and after working a cruise and the U.S. Uh, Customs Border Patrol guy is looking over my passport and he's African-American and he's wearing a name badge that says Thomas, last name Thomas. And he said a couple of words and I said to him, uh, Officer Thomas, you're from Georgia. And he freezes. <laughs> and he goes, I am, but how could you possibly know that? And I said, you're asking the wrong question. What's the right question? Why doesn't U.S. Customs and Border Patrol have people like me at every border crossing, <laughs> watching and listening to people coming into the country? I love that. Yeah, yes. pick, it up, pick it up. Because that's, I mean, I have frightened people. With the, uh, I was in a cab one night and uh, I looked at the guy's eyes 
because we that lock, we locked in the mirror. He said a couple of words, and Melly, I don't even know where this place is. But I said to him, "You're from Azerbaijan." He slams on the brakes, oh, wow. into the screen, and he goes, "Are you CIA?" I said, "No." He goes, "Nobody guesses Azerbaijan." I go, "It's a hobby. I just you know that." <laughs> but again, it's that that um, situational awareness, that awareness of things that that people just otherwise. And it, it comes in handy with a comedian. Yes. Because we're really paid observers. Mm. During the last session, I tried out with 12 police departments because being a cop was on my bucket list. And so I had several oral boards. And they said to me, okay, Frank, we give up. What's the connection between comedy and cops? I said, well, think about it. A, we're both paid observers. B, when a comedian steps on stage, you have to read the audience. Read, right. When a police officer rolls up on a scene, you have to read what's going on. Mm. You have to take the temperature of the crowd. And I said, and the third thing is, what you say first in any of those situations either escalates the problem or de-escalates the problem. So that's that's why that's that's what comedians do. We can we can we can move the crowd emotionally. Um, it, mm. once, once you've read the crowd and, and figure out where they are. I'm in an airport one time. I'm standing on this TV, and the plane is not leaving. Some kind of mechanical problem. And everybody's in a bad mood because they're going to miss the wedding. And so I'm reading this, and I think I think Nelia that we're we're also more empathetic. We feel what other people are feeling more strongly than the average person. So everybody's you know grumpy. I'm standing on the TV. It's on CNN. The guy next to me. Says loud enough for everybody in the gate area to hear, hey, how do we get this turned to Fox TV? So that was the opening I was waiting for. I said in a loud voice, well, you kill me first. <laughs> and the place exploded in laughter. Now they're still late. They're still not happy, but they're not, they're not grumpy anymore. They're all laughing. <laughs> I read the situation. I waited for their opening. I, he gave me the setup. Boom. It was like shattering glass. Just that one sentence. Yeah. Like, so I completely agree. Like when you were saying hypervigilance, I look at that as a good thing, like a positive thing. Oh, Not, yeah. Like, yeah, I love that you're saying change that into a gift because being um, more aware, I find that it's helpful to me. It, it helps me in so many situations. I think, I think I was thinking about this the other day. Because somebody got somebody got grabbed in a parking lot. Fortunately, they survived. You know, no, no serious damage, mental or physical. But somebody has sneaked up on them, and I'm thinking that's not going to happen to me. Because as I'm walking, I'm taking, I'm taking, I'm, I'm seeing who's around me and which way they're heading. Mm. You know what I mean? And you can tell sometimes by somebody's gait whether they have good intentions or bad intentions. Yeah, you know, it's some, some people think of that as paranoia. I think of that as being smart. And yes. intuition and all of those things. So when you said when your car breaks down, the third thing you thought of was, oh, maybe I'll kill myself. To me, when you said that, when I heard that in the TED Talk, it wasn't shocking to me. But then it was to the other people that were watching. You know, it was interesting. <laughs> it was interesting because I'm like, I can see how you can go from one thought all the way over here in such a short amount of time. Whereas people who don't have that uh don't think in the same way can't understand how you can go from one to an extreme so quickly yes and i have a psychiatrist friend who has chronic suicidal ideation and we were chatting about it one day and i said i believe that it helps keep me alive hmm. because i've made the um, one of the one of the legs of the three legged stool of stool of suicide is you've made the decision you can end your life because infants have an amazing will to survive, mm -hmm. but you've already crossed that barrier that border. Uh, and I believe that mo most people who die by suicide don't want to kill themselves; they simply want to end the pain. So, because I and willing to kill myself at any moment, I can stand a great deal more pain knowing that I'm in control of the situation. Mm. And he said to me, yeah, Frank, one of my clients said to me, you know, if it weren't for my chronic suicidal ideation, I'd have killed myself a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, dear. 
Yeah, but, another suit, another superpower. Uh, you know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. Frank, I gotta ask you because people can say the dumbest things to somebody who comes to them and says, Hey, you know, I can't, I just can't do this anymore. You know, I want to kill myself. And people sometimes not from a lack of concern, but people just don't know what to say. And I find that if they say the wrong thing, it can really be that tipping sometimes. And so it's very, very important that people know what to say and what not to say. Yes, absolutely. That's what, that's, that. That, yeah. Yes, that's in my, um, that's when I realized that I wanted to speak on suicide prevention. Uh, there'll be a cat's butt here in a minute. Uh, the, <laughs> oh, love it, love it. The, um, another benefit of Zoom is animals wandering through. The, the, when I do my keynotes, the the curriculums I've studied, I got several certificates. When I decided to do suicide prevention speaking, I thought I need to get some training. Mm -hmm. So I got several cert certifications in suicide prevention. And so that's that's what I teach. And I teach signs and symptoms, depression, thoughts, suicide, what to say, more importantly, what not to say, what to do yeah. and what not to do, and how to find resources. So the I tell them, look, here's what you don't say. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Turn that frown upside down. I know. Here's my favorite. Have you tried fish oil? Uh, Get some more yeah. sun. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, exercise. Yes. Uh, here's what you do say, I believe. I'm here for you and I mean it. I know you're not crazy lazy or self-absorbed. I know that depression is a mental illness. I also know that with time and treatment, things will get better. I will take the time. I'll help you get the treatment. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the tough part of this equation. You have to ask them, I believe, in no uncertain terms, are you having thoughts of suicide? And I tell my audience, if you can't say that out loud, you find somebody who can. And if you cannot find somebody who will ask that, I put my phone number up on the screen. Call me and I'll ask them. If intuition tells you that you believe they're circling the drain, Somebody needs to say that out loud. And, and if you do say it out loud, there's a better chance that they will not do it. There used mm -hmm. to be a, a feeling that if you mentioned the suicide word in front of somebody who's depressed, it would give them the idea, which I think is, is hilarious. Suicide? What a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Trust me. It's crossed my mind. Uh, and then let's say they admit they are having thoughts of suicide. Lord, if they pull that pin, drop that grenade in your lap, what now? Well, you say simply, do you have a plan? And if they have a plan, well, what is your plan? And if it's detailed, time, place, and method, do your best to get them to allow you to take them to a mental health facility, not, not for a lockdown, but just to be evaluated. Mm -hmm. Is it is it schizoaffective disorder? Is it major depressive disorder? Is it bipolar disorder? I mean, you know, just get... And, and then perhaps get medicated. And uh, then the psychiatrist I was talking about who has chronic suicidal ideation, and I were talking, because that's where the protocol stops. And every class I've taken, that's where it stops. And I said, well, what happens if they've got a plan, but it's not detailed? Mm -hmm. So we came up with this. Are you, you know, you've got a plan, but it's not really detailed. So here's what we would say. Well, tell me, are you going to kill yourself? And if they say no, then you say, okay, tell me why not. Mm. Make them give voice to whatever is keeping them here or something is keeping them here. Otherwise, you wouldn't be having this conversation. You know, my parents, my kids, my church, my religion, my whatever. Mm -hmm. Make them give voice. In uh, suicide prevention, it's called a turning point. If you can get them to voice why they're still here, then you can leverage that. Mm. And then I would say, look. Can we just make a plan to keep you safe just for today? Because oftentimes when people are depressed, they're thinking, you know, they're not thinking beyond the immediate. They, right. there, there's an irony in that there's something called burdensomeness. Okay. Burdensomeness is the second leg of the three-legged stool of suicidality. The third is social isolation. But burdensomeness is 
people who are suicidal often believe that the world will be better off without them. And so, although it looks selfish, suicide does, from the outside looking in, from the inside looking out, it's a selfless act because I believe the world would be better off without me. Mm -hmm. And what I tell parents all the time, we have a, a young person that has expressed um, thoughts of suicide. I said, look, don't say things like, you've got so much to live for. You know, here's what you should say, I believe. At odd times, I know that oftentimes you felt like we would be better off without you. But I want you to know in no uncertain terms, we would not be better off without you. Mm. So anyway, that's, that's, <laughs> that's my, you know, my junior oh, psychology approach. And as you were saying, you know, say to the person, I can, you know, I will get you help. I will do this and I will do that. If you're going to offer it, do it. Yes, you got to make mean sure that you follow through. Because if you don't, I think that's just another nail in, you know what I mean? I think yeah. if you're going to offer it, you really need to be genuine. And if you feel that you can't, you're not in that place, find someone who can. Yes. And if you've had this conversation with somebody, um, I, I, I speak to uh, six occupations that have the highest rate of suicide in the U.S. One of them is dentists. And I say, look, you know, if somebody expresses, you ask them how they're doing, and they say they're depressed and suicidal, mm. then, of course, that, you go through the rest of the, uh, you know, the procedure. Mm -hmm. But I said, also, have somebody on staff whose job it is simply mm. two days hence, 48 hours, no more, to call the patient back. And say, listen, when you're in here the other day, you know, it seems like you're struggling. Like, we just called to, to check in to make sure you're okay. Yeah, because nobody else might know what's going on. No. Maybe that one strain, you know, that one person is is the one lifeline you have. You just don't know. We don't tend to tell, I don't know, from the experience that I've had with friends and coworkers, don't necessarily um, voice it all the time. I know you were saying the more serious and the more... Uh, chance that you are going to go through with it is people who vo vocalize it more. But I have heard, like, for example, um, a child once came to me and said, you know, I want to harm myself. I want to. And they had specific ways. And then so I brought the child into the hospital and I said, look, you need to help me. I don't know. Um you know, how serious this person is. I don't know what to do. And so they left the room and they looked at the child and they said, do you want to kill yourself? And they said, no, 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 no. Because they didn't realize that saying I want to harm myself meant oh. because it's a child. So sometimes I think you just need to really listen to, but you can't make that call for anybody. All you can do is say, this isn't my call to make. I just need to help you. Well, and here's the good news. We should yes. have the good news. <laughs> no, no. Here's the good news. And I tell my audience this. Um, even though one person dies in North America, I buy suicide every nine minutes. Wow. Uh, wow. And in the world, in the world every 40 seconds. I tell the audience, because I like to make the audience the hero in peace. I say, you can make a difference. You can save a life. And you can do it by doing something as simple as what we're doing right here. And that is starting the conversation because... Eight out of 10 people who are suicidal on average are ambivalent. They cannot make up their mind. Nine out of 10 oh. give hints in the last seven days leading up to an attempt, which means the vast majority of people can be saved. The vast majority of people want to be saved. Oh. If you know how to look and listen and interpret the, you know, the signs and signals and, and then step in. Don't have to be a clinician to stop a suicide. Just have to be somebody who knows what they're doing and cares. Don't be indifferent. Like the worst thing you can do is say nothing. It's even better to say the wrong thing than nothing, correct? Or Yes. And, but you know, people, I understand why people don't say anything because they're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing and push them over yeah. there. It's like, I didn't want to mention, well, there's a, a politician um, lost his son, uh, I think um, last year, I believe in 2021. Okay. And he, he knew in his heart, his son was struggling and, and having thoughts of suicide 
but he didn't want to say anything. Mm. You know, and then push him toward, and now he realizes that's exactly the opposite. Mm-hmm. You know, saying something will, chances are they will not attempt suicide. I mean, it, it's a little counterintuitive. Um, yeah. One Another tip, by the way, is psychotropics, medications. I talked to women doing a documentary, and their research shows that any, on average, antidepressants or whatever, one third of the people who take a particular medication love one third eh, and the other third of your god Hmm. so that means only one third of psychotropics are working in the way they're intended so there's now a cheek swab dna test for a couple hundred bucks Hmm. where they'll take your dna and try to match it to the the drug really yes that works best with your metabolism so you don't get so much of that go on didn't work taper oh that's awful yes yeah i've been there it's terrible yeah, and you know, honestly, the doctor only knows about the drug when the drug salesman told him. So my pharmacist, I always ask my pharmacist because he knows mm. all the interactions, all the pros and cons, you know, side effects. Should mm-hmm. I be taking this? So yeah, so it's 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 if you go to Gene Site, G E N E S I T E, I think GeneSite.com, just type in depression, uh, DNA cheek swab tests, uh, drugs. That's amazing. Well, That's a phenomenal. Hey, half a dozen companies now doing it. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I've talked to clinicians who didn't know that existed. I'm like, how does, how does, how do you not I gotta ask that? my family doctor if he knows about that. Yeah. But it's and, true because coming off of stuff and going on stuff, wow, not only does it mess you up, you know, your, your body, but your mind, and it just makes things worse sometimes. And then it makes you feel more hopeless because everything takes so long to get right. So this is phenomenal. I'm glad to hear that. I didn't know about that either. Yeah, and many people don't. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it's not perfect. It's going to narrow it down. But I mean, even narrowing it down to, you know, to a couple of medications that work best with your personal DNA, my personal metabolism uh, would Mm -hmm. seem to be. I got lucky with the antidepressant I take. It works for me right off the bat. Um, My wife noticed within two weeks that something had changed, but didn't say anything because she didn't want to, you know, (laughs) wanted to wait to see what I thought. Yes. Three weeks, I had this thought. For the first time since I was 18, the thought popped into my head, I like my life. Aww. Now, I've got a good life anyway, but I hadn't had that particular thought. My <laughs> second thought uh, and that was, why did I wait so long to take this drug? Yeah, some people are so ashamed and they don't yeah. have to be. Yeah, it's like, oh, I'm not going to do that. It's going to alter everything about me. No, if it alters yes. and numbs how you feel completely and you're not able to feel, you're on the wrong thing. You know, I'm yes. also on a medication and I it doesn't alter who I am. It just helps me. Yeah, so, mine takes the edge off. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, no I've shame. had... Shame. Or, yeah, and the shame. Uh, and by the way, people tell me things after... I, when I do my show, I do a general Q&A and then I say before I start that, look, if you have a question or a story to share that you don't want to share with everybody in the room, you know, something mm. you want to ask me, hey, Frank, I'm crazy. Can you help me? Then I'll hang out for another 30, 45 minutes to take these questions individually. And oftentimes, well, you, there's almost always somebody. Sometimes it's two people. Sometimes it's 10. And and they tell me things they've told no one. Mm. People start the kind of start. Because they know you're going to get it. Yes, exactly, because they know I hear the same music. Mm -hmm. And so they usually start like this. I've never told anybody this. And I go, you know, I get that a lot. Um, (laughs) uh, (laughs) But it's it's, a young man. I I was doing a a show. Construction has the highest rate of suicide of any industry. Really? Yeah, 1,000 people die by by accident accident in construction every year. 5,000 on average die by suicide. Wow. You're five you times more likely to jump off the building than fall off. Oh. So it's male heavy. Eight out of 10 people who die by suicide nowadays are men. It's, you know, because the old big boys don't cry, they don't reach out. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing this in Cincinnati. There's 180 guys, mostly guys, some women. And and I tell my story. And a young man comes up, um, a, black, a black young man, uh, mid 20s, I'm guessing. And he's crying. Mm-hmm. Crying so hard he can't speak. So I wait. And when he can gather himself, I ask him, you know, what's up? And he said, well, 
Um, I'm not sleeping. I, I haven't slept for the last two nights. He said, in the last year, I've lost three people close to me, including my, to violence, mm. to violence, including my daughter who died in my arms. Mm. Now, he has never told anybody. So I made sure that I connected him with the HR guy who was there. And I said, look, to the HR guy, you need to take him by the hand. Mm. to a mental health facility for evaluation and possibly medication because he's, he's circling the drain. And he may not even know it. He knows something's up, but he may not even yeah. know it sometimes. Yes. And so, mm. you know, it, it, he hadn't told anybody and he's living with this. And, but by telling my story by uh, Brene Brown, I was listening to her book, uh, you know, on vulnerability. Everybody kept after me. You got to listen to Brene Brown. Brene, uh, how good could she be? She's so good. I got the audio book. <laughs> Yeah, I'm halfway through, and she's talking about vulnerability as a superpower. And I thought, oh, my God, <laughs> that's my superpower. I go up there, and I tell the audience I am nuttier than a squirrel turd, and they open up. Mm. So I give You're, people permission. You save lives every day, every day that you talk about this stuff. That's my goal is actually to save a life a day. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you are. We I may have saved one today. Yes. I got to ask you, um, the first time you thought about and you acted on one, you know, needing to kill yourself, did you speak it out loud to somebody? No. Um, I, I, I was 26, I think. It was five in the afternoon and I'm driving down Highway 163 in San Diego. I'm married to my high school sweetheart, a lovely woman, but we didn't belong together. Um, and I'm selling insurance, working for her dad's company, which is a great business, but it, I was miserable. Mm -hmm. And the thought occurred to me, why don't you just kill yourself? And I realized that if I didn't change, if I didn't do something different, if I didn't pursue what I was born to pursue, I thought, because my lovely ex-wife did not like the idea of me doing comedy. That was not her goal, vision for us. If I didn't do that, sooner rather or later, I was going to kill myself. That's why my fourth TEDx talk yeah. is called Suicide, The Secret of My Success, Dead Man Talking. Hmm. Because I realized, you know, I could divorce my wife, quit my job, do comedy. If it worked, great. If it didn't, hell, I could still kill myself. That was that's what got me into comedy. That's why suicide is the secret of my success. Now I told the audience at TEDx, I'm not suggesting that anybody adopt suicide right, right. as success strategy. And but at that point, though, I thought that was just me. Hmm. I was the only one on the planet who thought that way. And I thought, you know, and I think again, it was a superpower in that. Let's say I had a twin, and he was married miserably, hated his job, thought he should be doing comedy. Okay, so he could think, well, I'll divorce my wife, quit my job, I'll try comedy. If it works, great. If it doesn't, and here's where our paths diverge. Yes. If it doesn't, I will have lost everything. I had absolutely nothing to lose. Mm. Because if I stayed put, and that's how the talk opened up for that one. I said, um, what would you attempt if you knew for a fact you had nothing to lose? What audacious thing? would you attempt if you knew by not attempting it, mm. you would literally die. That's where I was in January of 1984. Mm. And then I go into the, you know, the story. So yeah, the suicides is the, is the got me into comedy because I knew that's where I belong. And I knew if I didn't do it, I was, I was going to kill myself. Saved your life more it than did. It, Oddly enough. Yeah. And by the way, the reason I didn't pull the trigger in 2010 Mm -hmm. was because my life insurance policy of a million dollars, I didn't know, I knew having sold insurance that it had a two-year suicide clause. What I didn't know is how long I'd had the policy because I, I was burdensomeness. I was worth more dead than alive to my wife. I, could, I couldn't, I, I, I wanted to fix her financially and I was willing to kill myself to do it. Mm. And so I called my agent. A kind, caring, and, and very perceptive gentleman, it turns out. And I said to him, hey, Graham, how long have I had the policy? You know, offhandedly. He goes, I don't know. I'll check. So I hear him clacking on the computer keys. He comes back and he goes, you've had it 22 months? And no, don't do it. 
Hmm. Because he had delivered checks. People called. Wow. Laws is in force. Next thing you know, he's delivering a check to the beneficiary. So yeah, it's it's so life insurance ironically saved my life. You know, when I was listening to your TED talk and you were talking about the moment where you had um the barrel of your gun, and then you you uh mentioned about the insurance, you know, because I was so into what you were saying, I almost kind of chuckled when you said that about the insurance. <laughs> because I'm like, oh my gosh, should I not be laughing? But it wasn't funny, but at the same moment, I was kind of like, wow, sometimes it takes like this diversion or this thinking of someone else. Like how you said people think that people who take their lives are being selfish. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, it was the opposite. You were thinking about, oh my God, I can't do this. I can't leave my wife with, with nothing. With nothing. I was not going to leave my wife broken and, and broke. Yeah, and I think it's so important that people realize that because I hear that all the time. You know, every few months you hear about somebody taking their life that you even know sometimes. Yeah. And you hear, oh, well, it's just selfish. They're kids. They're only thinking of themselves. And it makes me so angry um, because people are so closed. They need to open their minds up a little bit and understand things a bit better. You don't have to feel the things that we feel to be empathetic. You don't have to be in that situation and in that moment to, you know, to have a, I don't know, to have maybe some more intelligence about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't have to go through something exactly like somebody else just to sort of put yourself in their shoes, even if it's just for a moment, if it's even if it's something you have never felt in your life. If you can try to imagine as much as you can, um, maybe people will see that in a different way. People will be more open to helping other people and not be so afraid of saying the wrong thing and not being so afraid of ignoring what they're seeing, what they're hearing. You know, it just, I think we can deal with this so much better and be there for each other. There's so much to learn. Like, Well, and when I speak, 25% of the population has a mental challenge. 75% mm. neurotypical. So I can always tell when I say, I, I can tell you what the barrel of my gun tastes like. You can see the people who are, have a mental challenge leaning forward all of a sudden. Because mm. they realize it's not an academic exercise for me. And the people who are neurotypical <laughs> leaning back mm -hmm. like, oh, dear God. But when I speak, I speak to both groups. I want to relate to the people who have the mental challenge. And I want to decode those mental challenges for the people who are neurotypical and care about somebody who has a mental challenge. Yes. It's, it's let them um, help them understand what's happening in. Uh, I'm uh, so glad. Life. I'm so glad and grateful that you do that because one is not more important than the other. They're different audiences. They're different people. They both need to work together. And my insurance agent said after he hung up the phone that day, he told his wife, I think Frank's going to kill himself. And after I did the TED talk and after I posted, and I mentioned him in it, okay. I called him up and he, he said, you know, Frank, when you, when I realized what you're up to, what you're really, you weren't really asking how long you've had the insurance. You were asking for, for permission to kill yourself. Mm -hmm. And he said, I, <clears throat> I said a quick prayer. And I hope that what I said next was the right thing. And I said, Graham, it doesn't matter oftentimes what you say mm -hmm. it matters that you said something and you're right it's it's it just you know it's it it wasn't yeah. it wasn't right or wrong it was just something he showed that he cared and he knew what i was up to and he what did not want me to end my life so. he he paid attention yeah it mattered to him yeah he, i'm sure he couldn't relate i'm sure he had no how could anybody be in such pain they wanted to end their lives mm -hmm. but that wasn't the point at that moment. It's funny how sometimes it's the strangers in our lives that make the most impact. Yes. You know, <laughs> and, and, and like I've come people. across that as well in my life. And I'm yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. People, Just, again, people tell me things that, you know, they've never, even their therapist, that guy in California said to me, uh, we're at a function. I was doing comedy and, and I told my table mate, yeah, I also speak on Tuesday prevention, told him my story. And so I'm on, on the way to the bathroom and I can hear the guy behind me because I know somebody's behind me. <laughs> and uh, he says, Frank, I've got that. Got what? I have chronic suicidal ideation. Mm. 
Mm. And he's, he's 69 years old. And he says, I've never told anybody, including my therapist. And you know why he hasn't told his therapist? Because if he voiced that to his therapist, they are bound by law in California to lock you down, for, or at least take you in front of a judge to get an involuntary detention order and lock you down for three days. So if we can make it okay for people to give voice to those thoughts without yeah, locking them down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, so that's my job. My clients tell me oftentimes, we just brought you in here to start the conversation. Well, that, that's what I do. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna, in the show notes, I'll post all the phone numbers that we need to post. You know, if we do have anybody who is struggling with a member of their family or somebody they know, or the person themselves, themselves is um is contemplating suicide that they they get help you know and they can uh, mental, reach health, it. mental health canada mhc mental health canada okay I mean, yeah canadian mental health association yeah they're yeah they're a good resource um in the u.s we just got the three digit suicide prevention lifeline number 988 mm. and there's a text line because they realize that younger people are more forthcoming in text Yes. So they don't phone call email. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes speaking it makes it the pain even more real to some people. It depends on how people express themselves, right? Yeah. So people express themselves in so many different ways. Um, I think it's great that those things are out there. And yeah, um, I know that you're giving away a free copy of the audiobook. Yes. On one of your men's um health. Is it men men's mental health book? Men's mental health four book series. Mm -hmm. um, each one is twelve guys. Twelve. Each one has a different issue. Twelve stories, um, and then each one tells how they're coping. Because men told us we want real men with real problems, and how they're really coping is would be very helpful. Mm. So we made it look like an automobile owner's manual, so maybe guys would pick it up. <laughs> Well, I'm going to listen to it for sure because, and I know we can find that on your website. I'm going to put all of that information in. Oh, I got I a little it. teary eyed there. What's that? I know I got a little choked up myself, but <laughs> but but oh. again, that, uh, it, that is the I get choked up on stage, and and, and you know that moves people. I mean, it's oh. they. I don't cry. I don't weep. But you can hear the catch in my voice, and you know I'm struggling because oh. I'm living it again. Yes. Uh, and so it's um, a young a young woman came up to me in Iowa. She goes, you made me, she made me laugh twice and cry once. I said, my job is done. <laughs> I love that. You're definitely in the right field. I, you know, I'm so glad that Wendy uh, went along with you. Oh, God. Your wife. That's, oh, yeah. That's yeah, so she, awesome. Yeah, she is. Uh, yeah, she is. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. Who divorces a woman like that? Uh <laughs> And she and she has believed in me at times when I didn't believe in myself and my my gifts, my talents, mm. and very supportive of the suicide prevention. I mean, once I locked on, yeah, that was my purpose and my passion. Things began to fall into place. Yeah, I, it's so important to me about people finding their their. It saved my life finding what I love to do. And I, I, I feel bad for people who haven't found that. Yes. You know, a lot of people, that's one of the things that I help people figure out. And a lot of people come to me and say, well, I'm not good at anything. I don't know what I care about. I don't You're like you do. You just haven't, you know, you haven't found it yet. You haven't looked within yourself enough to help figure that out and, and try new things. And, but the difference is phenomenal. Oh, yes. It's, um. It's, I mean, I still have other speeches and things I do. I do comedy. If they want me to yeah. do comedy, I do comedy, but I, I don't market into that. I don't push. Mm -hmm. I just. I market the suicide prevention. I go to bed thinking about it, wake up thinking about it. I don't have to push. You know, it, it's like breathing. Life is just so much more. Yeah, like breathing. It's just so much more. I don't even know if it's enjoyable is the, you know, when I'm doing the things that I love, I just, everything feels better. Like, I know this might sound crazy to some people, but <laughs> even like, I appreciate things more, you know, color feels better. Like music is a huge part of my life. And it's just, I don't know. I'm able to express myself better. I'm able to be there for the people that I love when I give to myself, you know, and then the community and all of these things. And I wouldn't be able to do any of that without it. And well, and somebody said to me, I was on a clubhouse, a clubhouse room, you know, one of the, and it was the topic was, how do you, how do you get confident on stage? So I waited until everybody else gave you a little suggestions. I said, hey, here's, a, here's an idea. Get up on stage and stand in your truth. 
and you will be supremely confident. I said, here's my tagline. I am often wrong. I am never in doubt. <laughs> I love it. I have a hard time speaking in front of people until I started, like I'd have panic attacks, have to take value, like the whole thing until I started to talk about what moves me and what I care about. And then I didn't care about how I was perceived. It was more, do people get my message? And I think that's when I started, stopped becoming afraid so much. I'm still not great at it, but it's doable now. Yeah. I was on college campus, uh, Montana University, University of Montana buildings. And these nice young men would drive me around town to various radio stations because the college event was open to the public. And they said to me, Frank, you know, comedians have a tough time on campus nowadays because people are so easily offended. Are you worried about offending anybody? Mm. And I said, gentlemen, if I was doing comedy, I would be very careful. You know, I would be very careful. But I'm on campus to keep people from dying by suicide. So if mm. somebody is offended and then I use an expletive. <laughs> Let said, them be offended. <laughs> yeah, F them. I don't care. Absolutely. Yeah. So Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. I'm not woke when it comes. I mean, I'm woke when it comes to terminology and pronouns or whatever. But I'm I'm not, I don't care. Yeah, if it hurt yeah. your feelings, oh I'm sorry. No, that's not what it's about. No, and I do the trigger warning. Look, we're gonna talk about things, they're very difficult. Yes. They raise strong emotions. If you need to leave the room, I'm not gonna say anything as you leave the room. You know, please go out, take a breath, come back in. So I'm I'm sensitive to all that, but yes. I'm I'm there to save lives. So um speak the truth. Yes, absolutely. Sorry feelings, but somebody may be alive tomorrow. It wouldn't have been yeah. because. Yeah, I won't let you stand in my way. No. Absolutely. Oh, Frank, thank you so much for this conversation. Let me leave the neurotypicals with an example. Yes. And yes, I closed please. my te my fourth TEDx with this. I didn't know how much impact this would have, but apparently it's people were quoted back to me. Oftentimes they don't understand what having a mental illness is luck. And I just like that character in Greek mythology, Sisyphus. His, he gave fire to man, that was his big sin. So the other gods decided, okay, you're gonna roll the rock up a hill every day. And if you can get the rock over the top of the hill, then you can retire. But of course, every time he got the rock into the top of the hill, it would roll back down to the bottom. Mm. So having a mental illness is like that. Every morning you wake up and there's a rock in the hill. Some days the rock is small and the hill's not so steep. Some days the rock is a boulder mm. and the hill is Everest. But every day there's a rock in the hill. And my job is to make sure that if you've heard my voice, that tomorrow morning when you wake up, you can still move the rock. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's That's very powerful. And unless you've been there, you don't know how powerful that is. So if you're listening, <laughs> if you're listening and you haven't felt that, know that people around you may have. Mm -hmm. And just be aware and trust your intuition. Ask questions and don't ignore things that you think may be small. You're looking for patterns. Yes. If your intuition says, I think he's depressed. There's probably a good chance. And if your intuition says, I think he may be suicidal, there's a good chance. You, you're taking in signals you may not be consciously aware of. Absolutely. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for, for continuing every day to share the, these messages. And I am so glad that you were intercepted every single time. Yeah. yeah. Well, somebody asked me, and I said, you know, I'll tell you what the barrel of my gun tastes like. And, and they said, well, what did it taste like? Mm. Said, relief. Wow. Boom, mic drop. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah, well, occasionally somebody will ask me, you're not a psychiatrist, you're not a psychiatrist, you're not even a therapist. What qualifies you to talk about suicide prevention? And I, and I just, I'm, I just, I can tell you what the barrel of my gun tastes like. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Um, everybody, go watch his TED Talks. Go watch his TEDx talks and check out, you know, I'm going to put, he's all over the place. Like I'm going to put all of his, uh, he's under the mental health comedian. Um, he's everywhere. So I'm going to put, he's got some YouTube stuff going on. And he was just telling me I should share with my son um, one of the videos on YouTube. Yes. And it was, it's Guy Bar. 
Dry bar. Dry bar. bar, yeah, dry it's, bar. In, it's in Provo, Utah. Yes. Yeah. There's there's comedy club clean. There's corporate clean. Mm. And there's Provo, Utah clean. And so it's so clean it squeaks. <laughs> and it's definitely go listen to that. It's yeah. a series on YouTube. It's been around, I think they've been around about 10 years. And you know, it's each com- each comic has their own 25 minute special. Mm. And I just recorded mine in April and it just went up on just went up on YouTube in the past month. And but I'll um I'll send you a link so you know. Yes. Oh, and you know what? Before we go, I think that sometimes people like we were talking earlier sometimes people are afraid to bring up the subject because they don't want to put anything into people's minds yeah i'm having a teenager i think way before you even think there's a problem i think every parent should have this conversation i yes. don't think it's going to put ideas into their heads it's just like talking about being bisexual or whatever it is that is out there and i think it's so important that we have these conversations before they actually need to be had so that's well, something I wanted to say. And in part because the last research I saw mm-hmm. said that 40% of high school students self-report anxiety and 60% of college students. And that's twice what it was 10 years ago. So, mm-hmm. you know, 40%, I'm no math major, but that's almost half. And 60% <laughs> is more than half. So that, that's definitely, I mean, you talk about driving safely. You talk about safe sex. Mm-hmm. You talk about, you know, uh, all sorts of ways of keeping yourself safe mm-hmm. physically yeah i think you should have a conversation about you know um absolutely about, and and destigma look if you ever have these feelings um there's no you know there's no shame in it mm-hmm. um you know we, we your your father and your mother and i will, will always love you we're here for you so just that was one of the benefits by the way. my mother's generation they never talked about it mm. but my sister and i and all our cousins it's everybody's out about it so mm-hmm. when their nieces and nephews had an issue, they had no problem saying, mom, I'm depressed. Mm, it's more accepted. Yes. And in 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 our, because our generation accepted it, then we passed it on to our nieces and nephews that, listen, this is, you know, this, you need to let us know if this is an issue. Yeah. Because I think when I was younger, if I had said that to my mom, when I had been thinking it in high school, she probably would have said, oh, oh honey, don't say that. Yeah. You know, whereas don't even think about that, you know, like it's something that can just be, you know, but yeah. So if you're listening to the show, I mean, reach out to Frank, reach out to me, reach out to anybody that you can. I'm going to post all of the numbers, all of the information. And my cell number, because I tell people in my keynote, look, if you're suicidal, call the life. If you're just having a bad day, call a crazy person. Here's my cell. And they do. Yeah. They call the text. Thank you. I did a construction show. I gave out, I said, look, we're going to do Q&A and then individual Q&A. And then I gave out my number. Mm. Woke up the next morning because I was going back to the same, you know, corporation, whatever, to speak again. And there's a text. You know, I was in New York. It was a New York text the number. I didn't recognize it. And it simply said, can I please <clears throat> get the number or help again? Wow. So didn't want to ask during Q&A, didn't want to ask to be seen talking to me individually, but reached out mm. for the, you know, the Suicide Prevention Lifeline number again. Mm. Thank you, Frank. Thank you so much. I My so pleasure. appreciate it. Let's connect again real soon, okay? I'll uh, send you that uh, link to my comedy special. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. Me too. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. If you enjoyed what you heard, please subscribe or leave a review. See you next week on the Giving Starts With You podcast.